Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today I'm going to answer another subscriber's question. So we're back to the NASDAQ killer. Uh, he asked another great question, so I figured I would mention it. I assume it's a he. I don't know. Maybe it's a she, but the little the little cool Wall Street guy is a guy, so I'll assume it's a guy. Um, <laughs> anyways, I had a video talking about the failure of models. Uh, I talk about it quite a bit. Models aren't being built correctly. Um, risk isn't being managed across the banking sector, across the finance sector. Uh, there's just a lot of sketchy things where there's just a lot of unqualified people. And I think a lot of people have good intentions. And there are mass stacks of people that have bad intentions that are mixed in with this. Anyways, models just suck and don't work because people are unqualified. And so they asked the question, you know, what are the most significant variables that you think can improve current models? So getting into this, the models aren't working thing, getting into this risk management thing, right? The question's being asked, well, what variables would you add to improve this? And so I think this is an excellent question because there are really two key issues on, I would say, competitiveness of models, correctness of models, stability of models. Uh, models in general, there's two kind of takes on this. And so I'll talk about the low hanging fruit that's been kind of the driver. But the two areas that you have are going to be data, which would be like variables, and then it's going to be models. So originally we built a bunch of models, right? So like in 1976, I believe, uh, the Black-Scholes came out, we could price derivative pricing and we could you know, do Europeans and American options and all this. And then we boomed in 2007 and 2008. And before all that, we were doing exotic financial engineering products and you know, mortgage-backed securities crashed and the whole market tanked. And so we realized the models that we had been using and building were not so good. And so we go and we add all these regulations and we build more and more models. And at the same time, right, hedge funds are trying to figure out how do I get an edge? How do I make more money? Uh, and so you kind of think about should, how do I get better models? Like this seems like a really odd thing. And I talk about it a lot. Yet people that run firms and banks and all these things and hedge funds, they'll tell you it's not easy to just hire a good quant to build models. Like you don't just put out an ad and say, you know, hiring expert quant. And then like they show up on your door and they have a big price tag and you're like, well, I'll pay the big price tag because they're going to build excellent models. Unfortunately, you can't sort these sorts of things out. It's really hard. Even being an industry practitioner and you interview people, uh, it can be challenging to weed out who really knows how to build a model and do it really well and who does not know how to build a model very well. And with the whole rise of data science and machine learning, um, the whole standards of building good models has basically just been thrown completely out the window. And so now it's just like people are just, you know, dots on page, fit line to dots. It's a model. And unfortunately, this has made it worse and worse and worse. And there's been all kinds of academics and industry practitioners besides myself who have been complaining about this. And yet it just seems like it falls on deaf ears. And the reason for this, I think, is because as we talked about, it's hard to improve this because you have to make things meet academic standards. And to meet, when I say that, meet academic standards, models have assumptions that have to be met. Often people that build models don't know all the assumptions. Or when the assumption fails, they don't understand what the consequences are of that failing. <clears throat> and we saw this with copula modeling uh, back in the 2007, 2008 crisis. Again, people didn't fully understand, I think, a lot of the assumptions that went into the distributions, that went into the calculations of the copula modelings. And when you have non stationarity of these distributions and the distribution shift, uh, you have a domino effect and you have what is called serial correlation, which is nothing new. And most of you should have learned this in your grad school uh, or even in undergrad. And it's basic econometrics and time series. And yet when we have these sorts of things, it's what happens when one or two mortgages default, uh, they continue to default. And so what happened, just a little, shed a little light on this, uh, dumb people took data and said, my data does this, therefore it'll always do this. I don't care about theory, like stochastic processes and the theory behind this and like the whole idea of stationarity. Uh, we're just going to throw that out the window or I'm going to shrink my time frame so that it does become stationary or I'm going to do things that hide the truth because I want to build models and say the models work and then you pay me a big fat bonus because my model makes money. Um, so this is the issue and the struggle with models. So really smart hedge funds said, hey, it's hard to find better people and I don't know how to find better people. And we've tried hiring a bunch of physicists, a bunch of quant programs started up. We've hired a bunch of these people that are specially trained in it. We don't know what to do. Uh, and a lot of them that are hiring 
themselves don't understand models, understand the difference between a good model and a bad model. They don't understand the difference between risk management and looking at the assumptions that were broken and monitoring them and why they're important. And so what happens is it's much easier to say, okay, instead of trying to figure out how to build better models or come up with new methodologies, what we're going to do is we're just going to get better data, right? Simple. So a bunch of these people went out and started this thing called alt data, which is alternative data. And so they've done all kinds of crazy things like use satellite imaging to like, I don't know, look at traffic patterns or like to see how many trucks go in and out of a factory to help predict, you know, I don't know, I'm sitting here. Not going to brand it, but I've got a Dickies ad with stickers in front of me. So let's say Dickies is making, you know, jeans. And um, we want to see how many trucks are going in and out. And if more trucks go out this quarter, obviously they're going to sell more products. And so the revenue is going to be higher than expected and the stock price is going to go up. And so we don't really need a fancy model. We can just use this alternative data, uh, put it into a simple like, you know, regression or factor model. And then we can use that to essentially say it's going to be more and we can make money with it. And they've done all kinds of crazy things and they've paid companies to go look at hotels to see how many lights are on or um, I think some of the other crazy things I've heard. But these companies just go out there and they go, okay, we want to collect alternative data that no one else has. Again, it's weird. It's creepy. Uh, maybe there's like security cameras they can tap into and pay someone to use. And they use all this and they collect all this alternative data. Okay. And so if you have data that no one else has, you have an edge. And it's far easier to do that, or at least it was in the beginning, um, than it was to actually find people to build better models here. So this is kind of the interesting piece answering that question, which variables do you add um, that would help with risk management? Well, you have kind of a two-part piece here. One, you need to be trained correctly to build models and better risk management practices. So even models that are built that meet all the assumptions when you're an expert, you understand and know which pieces of the model are most likely going to fail first, uh, which ones are going to probably never fail. And again, you can look at these sorts of things and you can try to figure them out and you can even create metrics to monitor these things. And you should have things to monitor these, especially the ones that fail commonly. And you can even, if you want to be super risk management practice you can create metrics to do all the different things all the way down the line. Even the things that you don't think will ever fail, you can create safeguards and put them in place. And then you have a dashboard and it follows these things and they're usually early predictors if you build your models correctly. And you go about that process building better models. And then on the flip side of that, uh, you would also just get alternative data here. So what variables would I add? Just find data that people don't have. I mean, <laughs> like trying to figure out cash flows of these companies, if you can figure that out and you can figure out if their earnings are gonna be higher or lower than they were the quarter before, uh, that's gonna be a huge advantage to you. Uh, what used to happen in the olden days, and I would argue from conversations I've had with individuals in the industry, uh, insider trading still happens, unfortunately. And, and of course, there's a big article on JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs where their vice, one of the vice presidents conducted insider trading, and rightfully so, the SEC is going after them. But insider trading has happened since the beginning of time. It will never essentially be gone away with. There are good people and bad people. Bad people do insider trading. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of investment firms go and they try to talk to the CEOs and the CFOs uh, and the COOs and everything of these firms and try to get some extra little tidbits and information, hoping to kind of gauge and figure out where the stock's going to head. Unfortunately, some companies do engage in that. So anyways, that's the variable selection thing. So yes, when I talk about retail traders as well, and I kind of laugh and then people say, oh, Dimitri, you're so mean and you know you shouldn't be for the big companies. You guys have to realize these companies are paying millions and millions and millions of dollars like these hedge funds for alternative data that you don't have. And it costs them money to go collect that. So it makes sense it costs money. Now, is it ethically right for them to do that? I'm not going to talk about that today. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. <laughs>